If you ever visit the small village of Oriskany, New York, you'll find a nice memorial to a battle that happened almost 250 years ago. It's a little-known clash that had huge implications. And it's interesting because it's one of the few conflicts in the American Revolution where the British were barely even there. You know why? Because the Battle of Oriskany was a fight between North Americans. And if there's ever another American Civil War, it's not going to be a tidy division between North and South. It's going to be more like this, a chaotic mess of neighbors fighting neighbors, friends turning into foes, and even families turning inward. To make sense of all of it, it might help to go back to the roots of the Iroquois Confederacy, which was an alliance of Haudenosaunee people in modern-day New York, including the Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and later the Tuscarora. They were united under a nice banner of peace, and they thrived long before the American Revolution ever ignited. And it was that historic event that would sow the seeds of division, eventually tearing them apart. And it all started at the Battle of Oriskany. By that point in the American Revolution, the colonies were knee-deep in their fight for independence. The British were very frustrated with this pesky rebellion. And so they hatch a plan to split up the colony of New York in order to isolate the New England colonies, which were the main rabble-rousers. The plan was to come in three different directions. British General John Burgoyne from the north... General William Howe from the south, and Colonel Barry St. Ledger from the west, all of them heading towards Albany. This would be the first time the war would reach central New York, where both Iroquois and colonists resided. Some who supported the British called Loyalists, and some who support the Rebellion called Patriots. The British plan went into action in June of 1777, with Burgoyne and his massive force of 8,000 coming down from Lake Champlain, while Ledger and his crew are swinging around the western part of the state, coming towards the Mohawk Valley. His biggest obstacle? Fort Stanwix, or Fort Schuyler, as it was known during this time. He's determined to take it down. On his way, he picks up hundreds of native warriors, most of them Mohawk and Seneca, led by a man named Joseph Brandt, or Tyendinaga, a half-English, half-Mohawk chief, who, at this point, was actively persuading other Iroquois to ally with the British. And this is what was happening during this time. Each nation of the Iroquois Confederacy was pretty much forced to choose a side. Most would choose the British. But many Oneida and Tuscarora would ally with the Patriots. And in the area of central New York, a certain Patriot, a brigadier general of the militia there, with the name of Nicholas Herkimer, is starting to gather troops. And thank goodness, because Ledger's forces are starting to close in on Fort Stanwix. And people find out about it because of a brave Oneida woman known as Two Kettles Together. She rides through British lines and spreads news about it. Kind of like an upstate New York Paul Revere. And with that news, Herkimer and his gathered ragtag militia of 800 set out on a march that would eventually be immortalized with Route 69. Quick to find out about this, Chief Joseph Brandt and a Loyalist officer named John Johnson rally hundreds of soldiers to go intercept. A combined force of Loyalists, Mohawk, Seneca, and more. Herkimer's militia, they're marching nicely, and by their second day, they reach the Oneida village of Oriska, New York. Oriska, N-Y. Oriskany. While there, 60 Oneida warriors join Herkimer's ranks. And this would include a chief named Han Yeri, a man in his 50s at this point, who's up riding on a horse, wielding a sword. And he kind of represents how many Oneida were ready to defend their lands and the American cause, even if it meant fighting against their fellow Haudenosaunee. And all of this tension is about to burst. Now, while they were on their way, Herkimer had sent some messengers over to Fort Stanwix, basically to let them know that help was on the way and to please fire three cannon shots to signal receipt of this message. So on the morning of August 6th, Herkimer doesn't want to move his force until he hears the three cannon shot signal from Fort Stanwix. But pressured by his men to keep moving, he agrees and they start moving. And this decision was a fateful one. 
because little did they know that Johnson and Brant had meticulously prepared an ambush just up ahead in a ravine, and the militia and Oneida allies were headed right towards it. At around 10 a.m., they start to descend into the ravine. Despite the peaceful atmosphere, one of the bloodiest battles of the entire American Revolution was about to take place. The plan for the ambush was to have Mohawk and Seneca hiding on the sides of the trail, with a group of loyalists at the end of the path waiting. Herkimer's force has no idea that it's walking right into a trap. However, the plan goes sideways because some of Brant's Iroquois prematurely fire. It still takes Herkimer's force completely by surprise, and the result was absolute chaos. Right off the bat, Colonel Ebenezer Cox of the militia was shot and killed. Herkimer is also hit, which killed his horse and shattered his leg. The ambush causes panic amongst his men, and many of them start to run, which resulted in a trail of dead that extended several miles away from the battlefield. Herkimer's officers carried him over to a tree and told him that he needed to retire, but he boldly declared in his thick German accent, I will face the enemy. And so he's sitting there under a tree, smoking a pipe and directing his men. And about an hour or so into the fighting, a thunderstorm breaks out, which causes a temporary pause in fighting. Meanwhile, over at Fort Stanwix, the messengers finally arrive, which prompts Patriot Lieutenant Colonel Marinus Willett to lead an attack known as a sortie on the temporarily unoccupied camps of the British Allied natives. Also during this time, a loyalist officer named John Butler tries to deceive Herkimer's militia by having his soldiers pose as help from Fort Stanwix. But the deception doesn't work, and the second part of the battle begins with intense close combat. Herkimer orders his men to form defensive circles. And during the chaos, Chief Han Yeri is fighting valiantly alongside his wife, two kettles together. And this makes her the only known woman to have taken part in the Battle of Oriskany. Soon after Willett's sortie, word spreads to the British allied natives and they start to go back to their camps and this departure pretty much signals an end of the immediate battle. Herkimer and his troops would retreat as well and the battle ends up having a somewhat inconclusive outcome. Technically it's a British victory but the discontent among their allied natives had a major impact on the morale of Ledger's force and beyond. It marked the first time Haudenosaunee had fought each other, igniting a civil war that would shatter their unity forever. It's not surprising that the battle site is referred to as a place of great sadness. After the war, the site underwent various transformations, but visitors today are still able to explore it. In honor of Herkimer, who ends up dying from his wounds after the battle, the town and county of Herkimer in New York were named. His sacrifice, along with all of the brave souls who fought on that day, were not in vain, however. They would play a crucial role in the siege of Fort Stanwix, an event that was happening simultaneously. So join me next time when we talk about that story and how the combination of these two events had a major impact on world history, and therefore us. We should never forget about the Battle of Oriskany. It shows us what civil war really looks like and why it should be avoided at all costs. Have a good one.